Okay, our last lecture then for chapter, I don't even know we're on, <laughs> nine, I believe. The first step now of any microbial infection then will involve the attachment of the organism to the tissue. So this is gonna be on the outside of the human body, some part of the skin, or maybe it'll be like in a mucosal surface in the mouth and the nose on the eye, something like that. But these attachments are established through specific um, interactions between a component on micro microbial surface, which is going to be some sort of ligand, and then some sort of receptor on the surface of the epithelial cell. And that pathogen is exploiting that receptor because the receptor wasn't made for taking in pathogen, but that pathogen made a ligand that matches the receptor. Now, high affinity antibody that bind to the microbial ligand instead of allowing it to interact with the epithelial cell will prevent that microbe from actually gaining access. So it can stop the infection before it even starts. This process is called neutralization. And the antibodies that do this are called ant uh, neutralizing antibodies. Now, because many infections starting mucosal surfaces in the mouth and the nose, uh, neutralization antibodies are often going to be found in mucosal secretions, which lots of times they're going to be IgA. So let's look at that in a picture form. I can get my mouse, there we go. Where we see our pathogen up here trying to get onto one of these receptors, but IgA will bind up all of the ligands that it would normally use to bind to that receptor, preventing it from ever gaining access. Now, if we have no antibodies binding up those receptors like we do here, or those uh, ligands like we do here, then binding to the receptor can happen and then the virus can be internalized. And so with our, oops, with our IgA, here we go. We're preventing infection from happening. And so therefore, nobody will even know the whys or that they were actually um, infected with a virus, or not infected with the virus, but they came in contact with the virus. And so this is the idea behind immunization. If we can immunize against influenza or from COVID or whatever it might be to make these antibodies to prevent the virus from even getting in, we would never know that we were, um, were, were exposed. And so it actually prevents the infection. Now, bacteria are a little bit different. And yes, the bacteria itself can cause an infection, but also bacteria have the ability, they're cells, and so they have the ability to make their own proteins and secrete their own proteins. And sometimes those proteins can be toxic to people. And so it's actually the protein toxins that cause the disease rather than the bacteria themselves. And so just like we saw with the virus, the toxin has to bind to the surface of the epithelial cell in order to have some sort of effect. Just like with the viruses, antibody can bind those toxins and neutralize them before they can even have any interaction. Now, instead of having IgA be the main one here, IgA can definitely work, but IgG is actually the main source of neutralizing antibodies for protein toxins. Um, unless it's at a mucosal service, then we're looking at probably IgA because of the mucosal um, secretion that, that Ig is usually found in. But anyways, this table here shows a variety of diseases, ones that you've heard of, definitely tetanus. Um, we see whooping cough somewhat. We see food poisoning and toxic shock syndrome a lot um, in the present days. And those are produced by um, bacterial toxins. So for like food poisoning, in this case, it can be Staph aureus produces a toxin um, or toxic shock syndrome is uh, caused by a toxin produced by Staph aureus. But IgG can be used to neutralize that toxin so it never interacts with the cells. Okay, but now we also can have situations where animals like snakes or scorpions can, um, bees, well, kind of, um, not really bees, that's a different one. Um, um, they can make proteins as well that are poisonous or toxin, toxic to human cells. 
And um, I guess bees through their sting. Um, anyway, so those proteins kind of look like bacterial toxins. They're just proteins. The body doesn't know if it comes from a bacteria or from an animal. Um, but those toxins might actually have such an effect that they can cause like neurologic symptoms or par paralysis uh, and can lead to death. If the, primary, if the primary response is too slow, which if it's the first time you've ever been exposed to a poisonous snake bite, you're probably not gonna have high affinity antibody lying around. So in this case, where it's a venom that is very rare, you're not gonna vaccinate an entire population against say a rattlesnake venom, but rather you're going to have um, anti-venom available. So IVIG that would bind up quickly. It would be a passive, um, uh, you would get the antibody passively through an injection rather than having to make it yourself based on exposure. And so we call this a passive immunization because the body itself does not have to go through the process of making the IgG, but rather the IgG is just given and it quickly neutralizes the venom or the poison that has been injected into the body. And so this is very, very similar to how baby gets antibody from mom through breastfeeding or in utero. Now, only a fraction of the antibody um, have a direct inhibitory effect on a pathogen. More commonly, the antibody is going to fight a bacterial infection by way of activating complement. And this is going to be through the act or through the um, classical pathway of complement activation. So we have to visit complement one last time for the semester. We're gonna go fast because you know it all, or at least you could go back and you can review it. But it's pretty much the same that we saw with the lectin pathway, but instead of having C-reactive protein or mannose binding lectin being the activator, it's IgM being the activator. And it's the classical pathway because it is um, adaptive immune system with antibody activating it. So the only difference between this and the lectin binding uh, is that that is IgM that attaches to the surface of the pathogen, forms multiple attachment points because there's 10 possible binding spots. And that becomes, then it bends just ever so slightly and exposes FC portions of this pentamer IgM. And that creates a landing pad, essentially, for C1Q. C1Q is that stock protein that has C1S and C1R proteases involved. Once that binds, then C1R is going to become activated and cleave C1S. C1S then is going to be responsible for cleaving both C4 and C2. C4B attaches to the surface along with C2A. We have C4B, C2A on the surface, and we know that as the classical C3 convertase. If it's a C3 convertase, its role is going to be to cleave C3. And now we're all converging on the same spot where we have C3 come in, C3 will be cleaved, C3B attaches, C3A goes away. Now we have C3B, then BB will come in, or B will come in and get cleaved, BB will join the C3B and leave, and C3A will leave, and BA will leave, <laughs> sorry. This is, um, now we have the alternative pathway of com or the alternative C3 convertase and the classical C3 convertase. And so C3 is cleaved all over the place. C3B is deposited all over the place. C3A goes away and does this anaphylatoxic stuff. And C3B then will increase phagocytosis because uh, of the opsonization. Um, or, and, or it can initiate the membrane attack complex formation. So um, 
<clears throat> when IgG is bound, uh, IgG can also uh, initiate classical pathway of complement. It's just not as good because there's just not as many binding spots as you have with pentamer IgM. So it's okay, but definitely IgM is better. Uh, after the complexes of antigen and IgG have activated our C1 um, protein or the C1Q comes in, then it's going to just proceed the exact same way. So that we saw with the mannose binding and eventually then with the um, um, C-react protein and then on through the, the alternative pathway. So it's, it's just the same. You, you have IgG bringing in C1Q, um, but it's not as good. So anyways, you get a lot of opsonization. We get membrane attack complexes formed because of all the deposition of C3B. IgG antigen binding sites are really good. They are going to be high affinity. They are going to be able to really bind tightly to antigen and much more so than IgM can. And so they will form stable interactions with antigen that are multivalent, valent, meaning they have lots of different epitopes on them, but they're still soluble. So these soluble complexes then are going to also be able to activate the alternative, or sorry, the, the classical um, pathway of complement directly on this multivalent um, antigen. Uh, this though, because it's not a cell, is going to just be opsonized and then uh, the phagocytes are going to be able to take it up. So there won't be a membrane attack complex made, but phagocytosis can um, recognize the um, either the FC portions of the antibody could be opsonin, or if um, C3B is there, it can recognize the complement as well. So it can clear. So IgG is okay for activating complement. It's just IgM is better. Now, immune complexes that have the C3B deposited on it um, can also be picked up by red blood cells. And you're like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Why is this, why are we talking about red blood cells? They don't really do anything except for carry oxygen. Well, red blood cells do have complement receptors on their surface. And so there's, there's still, little circulating packets of like male system where they not only now deliver oxygen, but they can also grab anything that's tagged with complement. And as they make their way through the spleen or through the liver, where there's a lot of macrophages, they can deliver the complement um, coded antigen right to the macrophages in the liver, in the spleen, and help with clearing. So red blood cells not only can carry oxygen, but they can also, you know, like, well, if you go in that way, why don't you grab this antigen too, and or this pathogen too, or whatever it is, and go ahead and feed it to the the macrophages as you as you slip through the spleen and liver, and then they'll eat that. So it's it's pretty pretty crazy. And then the red blood cell isn't um, harmed at all. Okay, so. FC gamma receptors are receptors that recognize the FC portion of IgG. And they are constitutively expressed by monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. So dendritic cells have the capacity to bind the FC portion of IgG. So a major function then of these FC gamma receptors is to help take up pathogen that have been coated with antibodies and degrade them through phagocytosis. So after a pathogen has been coated with antibody, and then that antibody's FC portion has bound to 
the phagocyte. There will be interactions between the FC portion, the FC receptor that sends signals to the phagocyte to engulf it. And we know this as receptor mediated endocytosis. Once that happens, then the phagosome fuses with the lysosome and death and destruction of the pathogen occur. Fun, right? Phagocytosis. <laughs> uh, one more, here we go. Um, and this, this last piece is called antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity is ADCC for short. And this is a way that NK cells can also play along in the game. So NK cells can recognize cells that are coded with antibody. They also have FC gamma receptors, a different type of FC gamma receptor, but nonetheless, a receptor that will recognize the FC portion of antibody. So if antibody is attached to the surface of a pathogen, that means its FC portion is going to be sticking up out into the, the abyss, right? Sticking out up into there. And an NK cell will recognize those FC regions of the antibody. That will cause um, cross-linking of those receptors on the NK cell. And the NK cell can actually degranulate or release its toxic cargo onto a target cell. This is really great for um, tumor cells. And when we look at ways to create therapies for killing tumor cells, you have a cancerous cell that we can tag with a monoclonal antibody. <clears throat> and then the NK cell can come in and target and kill that cancer cell. Now, potentially some healthy cells can die too, but that's worth the cause. That worth the cost of, you maybe kill so you have some collateral damage, but it's still pretty great. This is a great way to use the body's own immune system to fight cancer rather than using some sort of chemotherapeutic um, drug. Now, Antibody dependent cellular cell mediated cytotoxicity can only come into play once a pathogen specific IgG antibody um, is made. And so it's just tagging, it's essentially tagging a cell that needs to die by NK cells killing power. Okay. Summary slide. We've seen this like six times so far this semester, but I just love it. And so it just show, again shows the different functions that antibodies have, maybe some properties that antibodies have, and then which types of antibodies are most known for having those functions or having those properties. Uh, thanks for hanging with me for this set of lectures. And yeah. Well, we'll talk again soon.